Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of Warhammer Humor. This is a place where we take either some new or previously covered topics from the 40k setting and add a bit of humor. I know I told you last time that the series was gonna stop for a while, but lo and behold, the source of the Warhammer humor is up and running again. So, to celebrate that a little bit, I decided to bring back a topic that a lot of you enjoyed when I made the original video. This is the return of the reasonable marines. Today we shall take a look at their attitude and behavior towards some of the other Imperial and Xenos factions of the setting. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Chapter and the Inquisition are two factions that abhor one another, seeing the other one as a taint to what the Imperium should rightfully be. The reasonable marines find clashes with the Inquisition particularly unpleasant, and generally do their best to stay out of their way, although they do share a hatred of the demonic and of the warp in general. The Grey Knights, on the other hand, have shown remarkable reasonableness for operating alien devices in their all-out fight against demonkind. Thus, both the reasonable marines and the knights have earned each other's grudging respect and tolerance. Clashes with the Inquisition mostly occur in the forms of Sisters of Battle, whenever one steps on the other's toes. They have a particular disgust towards the sisters' overzealous and often vicious approach to dealing with any kind of problem. In these scenarios, the marines act like a rescue party, rounding up as many of the purge's targets as possible and retreating and judging them in a more civilized manner, or even occasionally rehabilitating them. Aside from the traitor legions, the Imperial forces attacking civilians are the only force that the marines will bring all traditional weapons to bear against, albeit reluctantly. The chapter's relations to the Imperial Guard are colorful to say the least. While relatively quick to ally with one another, it is never long before the two factions' command structures begin to butt heads with one another over some breach in rank and protocol. The Imperial Guard is usually the more reluctant of the two when it comes to buddying up, mainly because contact with the reasonable marines always ends up with a lot of the men trying to defect to the marines. The commissars have an unusual tendency to flare up the normally calm and reserved reasonable marines with their brutal approaches to treating the guardsmen. This can result in headaches for everyone, as clashes between the marines and the commissars are inevitable and generate a lot of paperwork. Just like the Imperial Guard, the reasonable marines' relations with other chapters can vary widely. However, recorded incidents of the marines engaging with other loyalist marines are unpleasantly common. Indeed, the reasonable marines have not forgotten the kinship they ought to share with other chapters though, and harbor a particular bitterness towards fighting them. In these cases, the adversity arises not so much out of pure hatred, as many of the chapters are aware of their existence and skeptical of the Inquisition's propaganda. It arises from conflicting goals. While some chapters team up with the marines just as often as they fight them, others are entirely incompatible. The reasonable marines definitely frown upon the blood angels, considering them more like beasts than space marines. Given the unstable nature of their gene seed and their borderline psychopathic affinity for close combat, the marines seldom deal with the blood angels. However, this opinion is conflicting as some captains have become fascinated by the stories of the chapter, somehow managing to ally and part peacefully with the Necrons, a foe that the Marines long believed to be entirely unreasonable. However, such interest is discouraged by the more senior battle brothers in the chapter. The reasonable Marines are very distrustful of the Dark Angels, certainly not beyond working with them, but far from accepting. While the marines are no stranger to being scrutinized as treacherous, the Dark Angels show a sort of morbid love in persecuting threats to their credibility. 
This behavior definitely means they have something to hide, and the marines usually keep their distance. They are particularly careful not to give the impression that they are in any way associated with the Fallen. The chapter has no problems whatsoever with the Imperial Fists, and finds great value in their defensive capabilities. In the times when relations are smooth, it is not uncommon for these two to collaborate in exchanging knowledge about the other's combat specializations. They still have the occasional disagreement, but they are often brief and usually resolve peacefully. While the reasonable marines consider the Raven Guard fierce rivals in the aspect of covert ops and tactics, this is also the reason why the reasonable marines respect the Raven Guard, and they go to great lengths to stay up to speed with their tacticians. The marines still get in scrapes with the Raven Guard, but more often than not in a more competitive manner than actually aggressive. However, on the rare occasion that the two chapters do come to blows, it results in a very long and very boring guerrilla campaign, fought almost entirely beyond the naked eye. It is not uncommon for bystanders to think, what the hell is happening? After several city blocks are vaporized, but life is still somehow able to move on as usual. While the reasonable marines are ones to admire in force tactics and strategy, the ultramarines and their codex are just another chapter to them, one that they are usually indifferent towards. They are easy enough to get along with, and in comparison to some of the other chapters, they are preferred to working with. However, in terms of overall ability, they find the ultramarines lacking, except in arrogance. This distaste has arisen from several occasions when the two did work together, only for the Ultramarines to take all the credit. Ever since, even the reasonable scouts view them with a sense of ire. Regarding their relationship with the Salamanders chapter, these two could not be greater opposites in terms of approaches to combat specialty and tactics. But also, they have a high regard for prioritizing human lives over destruction of the enemy. And that is why they get along very well, and they work easily together all the time. For the most part, the reasonable marines and the blood ravens find themselves as basic allies. However, any further bonding is hampered by one simple problem. The blood raven's fetishistic approach to battlefield scavenging. While the desperation of an unofficial, understrength chapter to use whatever they find is reasonable, that does not change the fact that the Ravens have a dark history of looting reasonable marine casualties for equipment and relics. While outright hostilities are rare, the Marines always keep an eye on the Ravens when one of them gets close to their armory. Some reasonable commanders though take this even further to the extent that all Blood Ravens have to stay outside of a one mile radius of all armories and relics. As with some other factions of the Imperium, the reasonable marines are equally distrustful of the Eldar. However, the chapter has come to accept that it is very possible that the Eldar have knowledge and foresight of future events, and as such give them a bit more leeway and take heed of their warnings. However, the marines refuse to be used as unwitting pawns, and they will not hesitate to bring force into the equation if there is evidence that they are being treated as expendable assets. While they generally apply the same ethics they treat all the other races with, the marines have often resorted to kidnapping farseers, warlocks or autarchs to make it clear that they will not be used. In a bizarre turn of events though, the reasonable marines claim free exodite worlds as their own. Having come under their protection after the craft world Biltan abandoned them to an emperor's children war fleet, which was eventually repelled by the combined efforts of the exodites and the reasonable marines themselves. To date, these worlds are the only sanctioned Xenos worlds in the entire Imperium, even if the knowledge of them is reserved only to a few people outside of the chapter. The marines make use of the exodites by having them teach them additional skills to their apothecaries and librarians. And the Eldar tend to agree to this for their own safety, ensuring that their protectors suffer fewer casualties and remain uncorrupted by chaos. 
Additionally, Exodite items are very popular when trading with the Tau. While the chapter will never abandon the Imperium and have no intention of joining the Tau Empire, the Tau are nevertheless a welcome change of pace for the chapter. The Marines are quick to aid the Tau in situations that do not concern the Imperium, and in return the Tau Septs generally coexist peacefully with the chapter. Trade is common between the worlds of the chapter and the Tau, and the Marines are even willing to humor the Tau ambassadors attempting to sway them towards the Empire. That isn't to say that the two have not had some battles though but compared to any other faction, these conflicts are often just shows of force rather than full-fledged warfare. The Marines' dealings with the Tau does come at a price though, often earning them a black mark against them in other chapters or regiments of the neighboring systems. You don't have to be a genius to know that the reasonable Marines would never allow chaos to triumph. The demons and the traitor legions are treated with the same aggressive and unrelenting effort as any other loyalist chapter would display. On rare occasions though, the traitor legions have looked the other way in the presence of the reasonable marines, maybe because word spread that they know the emperor is not a god. There is one big difference however, and that is in how the marines handle heresy among the people. The cults or rebellions are still persecuted, but with the chapter's usual non-lethal force. When members of a rebellion are rounded up, they are put through therapy and rehabilitation in order to try to restore them to being productive citizens again. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the reasonable marines and their relationships with the other factions for today. Now, there were descriptions of other interactions around, but I tried to pick the more interesting and funny ones out of those. Are you a fan of the reasonable marines? What do you like or dislike most about them? Do you agree with their non-violent politics and practices? Do feel free to share any thoughts or questions you may have about them in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. You can also click the bell notification icon to stay more up to date. Thanks a lot for watching to the end and have an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.